Well, good morning, everybody. Let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, as Advent is nearing a close, as the time in the book of Micah is drawing to a close, help us to constantly return to the reason for the season, also the reason that this book was written, which is to call us to repentance. Lord, help us to turn from our sinful ways, to constantly come to you, recognizing that we can lay everything before you in the confidence of the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins that you won for us by way of the cross, and you assure us of life and salvation by way of the empty tomb. Bless our time together this day. Bless us in our preparations for the coming of Christ, both at Christmas as we celebrate your birth, as well as we look to the coming of Christ on the last day. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Micah chapter 6 is where we pick up today. So we're going to turn directly to that. We had a chance to read Micah chapter 5 last week uh, after our class. You would have seen that there was a direct reference to the coming of Christ. And you actually hear that on Christmas Eve. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says this, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth, then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. Who is that talking about? Who is it talking about? But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. It's all pointing us to Jesus. This points us to the importance of what I was talking about last week, where the Old Testament, the prophets, all focus their attention on pointing us to the Christ. Pointing us forward to the son of David who was born in Bethlehem and would journey his way to Jerusalem at the age of approximately 33. Then when you get into the New Testament is when the shift happens. Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. You remember that Hebrew word, ruach, the breath, the spirit of God came rushing in that rushing wind. And the Spirit that allowed them to speak in multiple languages, which then brings us all the way to 2020, in the magnificent reality that we are able to, with our own eyes, with our own ears, with our own mouths, speak, read, hear the Word of God in our own language. So there's the shift. Old Testament pointing forward to Christ. New Testament points outward from Christ as we look forward to his final coming. Chapter 6 is an interesting scene for us to begin with. I'll share with you the words of chapter 6. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains. You might remember that at the beginning I said there's a lot of signifying words here. Behold, look, hear. Think he's trying to get our attention? Absolutely. Think he was trying to get some apathetic people to actually wake up from their slumbering sleep, falling away from the faith? Absolutely. You ever shout to try and give somebody's attention? Hmm, yeah. This is a get your attention word here. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent, you before, Moses, but sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people... Remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. <clears throat> Let's just stop there for a second. 
Because when we hear this, when you hear the words, plead your case, when you hear the word indictment, when you hear contend, when you hear answer me, what sort of imagery is he setting up? What does it sound like? A courtroom. Exactly. That is exactly. So number one says, what picture does Micah portray in chapter six? It's a courtroom. How many of you like law shows? Anybody like those types of shows? Yeah. My family growing up was really big Law and Order fans. And uh, they just, uh, and still to this day, they watch reruns of Law and Order and stuff. And they, so, but this was a courtroom scene portraying the case the Lord had against Israel. But here's the thing. Can we really bring charges against the Lord for being unfaithful? Hey God, we got the short end of the stick here. God, you didn't do what you said you were going to do. You didn't give me what I want. Isn't that what it boils down to? You didn't give me what I want. Has God ever been unfaithful? If we look from the lens of our emotions or our earthly circumstances, our situations that we find ourselves in, we will always deem that the Lord is unfaithful because we are looking from the wrong source. But if we look from what he has declared throughout Scripture and notice what he does, he says, how have I wearied you? Answer me. Come up with an answer. Come up with an answer. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. What is he doing there? What is he doing? Reminding them. Yeah. There's a reminder here. Did you forget that you were in slavery for 430 years? It always makes me think of just uh, when... The Pharisees in John chapter 8, they claim that they've never been slaves. It's actually the Jews, it's a group of Jews, but they've never been slaves of anyone, is what they say. And that's where you get the line, the Son will set you free. You know, that's the John chapter 8, and then the devil is deemed the father of all lies, that section. But they say, we've never been slaves of anyone. Have we forgotten our history? The people of God were slaves for 430 years. How did they get out? Remember, I am the one, God is saying, I'm the one that got you out. I'm the one who sent before you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Remember, Balak and Moab, I mean, Balaam, you remember Balaam, right? Balaam's the talking donkey story. Yeah. I always love that. If you watch Shrek, it's the same story, right? No, 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 no. Eddie Murphy, not to be synonymous with Balaam's donkey, okay? All right? But it is nice to know everything. You caught the joke there and everything, so it's nice that everybody watch Shrek, so. But he's reminding them, and isn't that so important for us as we navigate faith because how quick are we to forget God's goodness, grace, mercy, forgiveness when something bad happens? And it's like this massive blinder that's in front of us that keeps us from seeing all of the ways that God has fulfilled his promises. It may not be a pleasing 2020, all right? Everybody's like ready to see 2021 come, right? But think about it. Was God ever unfaithful in 2020? Even though we had this thing called a pandemic that we never even knew the word before? No, he's always been faithful. And there's a key word that I want you to pick up on. As you go through scripture, pay attention to the pronoun. Slow yourself down. Slow yourself down. Because twice he does it. Verse 3, he says what? Oh my people. Verse 5, oh my people. He does not say, oh you people. 
Those people. That bad bunch of people. He doesn't say that. You are a chosen race. A royal priesthood. You belong to the Lord. That's what he's saying. Even though they have been evil, they have fallen to idol after idol, he still has grace and mercy for them to call them my people. Just in a simple two-letter word, there is grace. Oh. So despite all of their sin, the Lord still refers to Israel as, and the two is, my people. My people. He refused to turn his back on them. Why does he do that? Why does he refuse to turn his back on his people here? Because he loves us. Yeah. John, or Romans chapter 8. Nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. They were his people. He cared for them. But... When you care for somebody, do you just simply say what they want to hear? Or do you speak the tough stuff, the tough love? The book of Micah is a book of some tough love. And so what has to come out of this is also discipline. If a parent spares their child discipline, can they honestly say that they love them? What do you think? He who spares the rod spoils the child. Spoils the child. I believe scripture even takes it as far as hates the child. I have to look that verse up for sure and everything, but the point being is discipline is a part of love. But not discipline with regard to abuse. Don't hear that. It's discipline with intent to teach and redirect. That's the purpose of discipline. The reason that you admonish a child or a student is because you see in them a behavior that is adverse to their benefit and health and well-being. And so, by then disciplining them, granting to them the gift of a consequence, which they never deem as a gift, but it helps them to pause and think if they want to do this again. And it usually comes from an older source, right? It comes from a parent or a teacher, and with their wisdom, then speaks a word of correction and direction so that they may go and sin no more. Here's the love of God here in the book of Micah. Yeah. I think it goes beyond that. I think it teaches them respect. I'm not, I couldn't argue with you at all. I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep, respect for authority. One doesn't actually respect an authority if they can simply get away with everything. So... To the parent that just simply says yes to everything, is the child going to respect the parent? No, because it's just simply then more of a doormat relationship where they just simply think, I can just do whatever I want to do. But they also miss out on that love where love does have, now love knows no bounds in terms of Christ, but does love have, does love include establishing boundaries? Yeah. My parents had a curfew for me. Get home after midnight, things go bad for you. Why? Because my parents knew when bars closed. And they didn't want me on the road when I could do them greater harm. And so they said, get off the road. So you're home. It's that type of knowledge is passed on. So now I look back and I'm like, everything, oh, that wasn't a bad deal. When I was 17 or 18, I might have argued. So, so is discipline good? It's not only good, but it's necessary. Yeah, it's good, it's necessary. So the answer is yes. It's good, it's necessary, it's beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. 
And so the case presented is, and number four there, is God's faithfulness versus Israel's unfaithfulness. God's faithfulness versus unfaithfulness. Israel had nothing to say in response to the Lord. In fact, the Lord was gracious enough to give them a preview of the Messiah and all that was yet to come in the midst of all this. But really, is Israel deserving of that gift? Are we deserving of that gift? And that's the reality here of when we talk about grace and mercy, and we use the words all the time, but do we pause to reflect that grace is God giving us what we don't deserve? That mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve? It's that reality of confession and absolution where I come before Christ as a beggar and recognize that the phrase not worthy is so applicable. I'm not even worthy to step in the house of the Lord, and yet he, out of his grace and his mercy, not only welcomes me into the house, but permits and rejoices at our dining at his table and feasting on his forgiveness. That's grace and mercy. The Lord had delivered them from evil men like Balak and Balaam, all right? So you can note on that everything. If you want to read about that, it's Numbers 22 to 24. We're not going to read those three chapters in light of time for today. But here's just an additional note if you have the Lutheran uh, study Bible. Balak hired Balaam to curse Israel but the Lord forced him to bless Israel instead. And then the Shittim and Gilgal, locations on the eastern and western sides of the Jordan River, which Israel crossed to enter Canaan. Remember, that's all part of him saying, look, remember, remember all the good things you've done. So, one thing I'll tell you, so my father-in-law, uh, I, I call on him quite, quite a bit really, in terms of ministry. One thing I always marvel about my father-in-law uh, is when we're at the dinner table and we're praying, and he always, and I would say almost without fail, starts off his prayers in gratitude. I could have just told him a whole bunch of bad things that happened, <laughs> and I'll say, Dad, could you pray for me? And he will start off with the words, thank you. And I'm like, maybe he wasn't listening. You know, I wasn't thinking the words, thank you. But from his perspective, as I've, I've tried to figure him out, um, is there's always something for which to give thanks. There's always something to be able to look back and remember all of God's grace and mercy. It's always there because he's done it all. And even as we look ahead, there's always something to give thanks for as well. And it's interesting, too, in Scripture because it tells us to present our request before God with what? With thanksgiving. When we give thanks, oftentimes, what is it giving thanks for? It's as our minds recall what happened in the past. So one of the things that we do at our dinner table, maybe you do this on Thanksgiving or something, but we go around the table every single day and everybody gets a chance to say in their, our closing prayer devotions, is something that they give thanks for, all right? And, but it's always something that happened in the past. So to take a moment, pause, and look back, because when we look forward, what do we tend to do? Any worriers out there? I, I love to worry. I, at least I figured I must love to worry, because I do it all the time. And yet, it never does any good, by the way. So... <clears throat> Yeah, it doesn't change anything. Yeah, 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 don't worry about, you know, there's enough trouble today. You don't need to worry about, you know, and I know what scripture says, but for some reason I have a hard time listening. My wife would say that on a daily basis. But <laughs> the thing is, as we look ahead, we oftentimes have a tendency to worry. When we look back, oh my goodness, there's so much to give thanks for, and it changes the perspective of looking ahead. Hey, look at all that God has done, and look at all that he will continue to do. 
So did Israel have a defense? Okay, you got the court case. Do they have a defense? Do they have something to stand on here? Okay, we prepared our case. We've got everything worked out and everything. What do we got? Nothing. Nothing. Can you imagine a courtroom scene like that and everything? Um, could you present your case and everything to the courtroom? Uh, we ain't got nothing, Your Honor. And that's exactly what we have. Think about it. What does the hymn say? Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Nothing. Nothing. And, and as I told the comrades this year, uh, everything, you've got worse than nothing because you have your sins. So it's worse than that. And yet what does Jesus say out of grace and mercy? I want your sins. Give them to me. And in exchange, this is the great reversal that happens in our lives. In exchange, I give you my holiness. I take your sins. You get my holiness. I take your death. You get my life. I take your damnation. You get my salvation. That's the reverse. That's what we rejoice at at Christmas. Because when Jesus comes down from heaven to earth, what happens? It flips the world upside down. They never expects this God to come in the form of a baby. In a manger. In a manger? To a poor family? To live this life that isn't done with pomp and circumstance? And then comes and doesn't have people lauding him, but has instead people rejecting him. And nobody expects that there to be victory... To the victor go the spoils. And that doesn't happen that way, right? To the victor goes the cross. History is written by the victors. <laughs> so it's interesting here because as history records it, the one who is victorious died. But where do you have to go? Three days later, the tomb is empty. A few weeks after that, he ascends into heaven and he's seated on his throne and he is victorious. All right. The Lord's requirements. All right. Uh, let me read a little bit more of this text here. With uh, Bring it up at verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Remember, they got nothing. So, Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? I mean, veal is good, but it's probably not going to work. Would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Now, remember, they're thinking the context here, the firstborn. There was human sacrifice among the pagan religions. This would be deemed absolutely heinous in the eyes of God. And yet... The prophet knows that this is what happens in other religions. He has told you, O man, this is one of our theme verses several years ago, Zion. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Okay, so the Lord's requirements, and I want to phrase this a little bit here, or put a little bit of everything, because I don't want you to see it just in a law context. But act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. So, what does God here expect of us? God expects us to repent, to walk humbly. Okay? He expects us to then, as we repent, he will respond with forgiveness. And then the response then, as we receive forgiveness, is to then follow him. What, is, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? As we are forgiven after repenting of our sins, the expectation then is that we don't jump back into the sin, taking God's grace for granted. But instead, utilize God's Ten Commandments 
to then direct us to follow him. Now, what, what do we know? We will fall. We will. Now, that's not an excuse to then fall more. We will fall, and when we fall, we return to our baptism, and we repent again, and we receive forgiveness, and then we go and sin no more. And what does God give us then to follow him? He gives us his commandments. Commandments 1 through 3, table of the law is that vertical relationship. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then commandments 4 through 10, the second table of the law, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, recognize the expectation of all of us is perfection. And yet, you and I are not perfect. He does call us to follow these commandments, but, again, going back to that great reversal, you have this beautiful exchange where God sends His Son to stand in your place to do perfectly what you could not do. Okay? So I think I told you last week, I said, I, I'm finding myself more and more praying the prayer, thank you, Lord, for being faithful for me. Um, because the reality is, I can't. I can't be perfectly faithful, nor can you. But Jesus not only can, but he did. Yeah, Barry. It's not only love your neighbor, but love your enemy. Yep, and pray for those, that those who persecute you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Turn the page here on my sheet. What is true wisdom? What is true wisdom? Yeah, the fear of the Lord. So if you were to look at Proverbs 1, you can do that on your own. But Proverbs chapter 1, you would see that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, what is the fear of the Lord? What is the fear of the Lord? Fear, trust, and love of God above all things. Fear, love, and trust in God above all things. But what is the fear of the Lord? It is, yeah, it's, uh, okay, that's, yep, respect. What else? Build on, build on that. There is an awe and a reverence before the Almighty God as one who has the power of to destroy me, and yet a steadfast love to save me. Think about that for a second. You stand before God in a holy fear because He could, because of your sin, absolutely crush you if He wanted to. And yet, what is his response toward you? When he looks at you, he sees that you are bathed in the blood of Jesus, his son. And he says, you are my people. Going back to the beginning passage. You belong to me, and I love you, and I will save you from my wrath by making my son endure it in your place. That's the fear of the Lord. The voice of the Lord cries in the city, verse 9, and it sound wisdom to fear your name. Hear of the rod and of him who appointed it. Can I forget any longer the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked? And the scant measure that is accursed, shall I acquit the man with wicked scales and with a bag of deceitful weights? Your rich men are full of violence, your inhabitants speak lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore I strike you with a grievous blow, making you desolate because of your sins. You shall eat but not be satisfied, and there shall be hunger within you. You shall put away but not preserve, and what you preserve I will give to the sword." You shall sow, but not reap. You shall tread olives, but not anoint yourselves with oil. You shall tread grapes, but not drink wine. 
For you have kept the statutes of Omri and all the works of the house of Ahab, and you have walked in, the, in their counsels that I may make a desolation and your inhabitants a hissing, so you shall bear the scorn of my people. The reality here is there is going to be a penalty for those that fall into idolatry. There will be. But there's a promise for God's people. All right, so shift really quick because we are in overtime already by about five minutes. But go to chapter 7, verses 18 to 20, and that's really why, as we finish this chapter, I want to leave you with that. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. As you ponder the book of Micah, think about, do you take God at your word or his word? And as you ponder that, do you take him at the character that you have given to him or the character that he manifests to you? Because the character of God is this. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. That Hebrew word is chesed. It does not even have an English equivalent. Steadfast love is actually... It's inadequate. You can't even begin to fathom or describe the love of God that he has for you. Let's close with a blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us now and always. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone.